I'm Mason Mount. You're listening to the London is Blue podcast. Welcome back, Chelsea fans, to yet another episode of the London is Blue podcast. Coming at you with Dan and Nick yet again, and special guest Naz from Goal.com. What's up, Naz? Hi, guys. Great to be back. Yeah, I mean, new season, new manager. It's been a while. We've got so much to talk about, haven't we? It has been a little while, sadly enough. Um, social media makes it easy for us to stay in touch kind of lightly, so don't worry. We've been, we've been following the tweets, and obviously Dan and, and Nick, looks looks good to have you guys back. I'm glad we can continue this hot streak of just multi-city podcasting yet again. That's right. We are we are coming live at you from three different cities, four different cities, counting Naz this week. The wonders of technology. I'm in San Francisco yet again. It's Another hotel here. room. You just yep. can't settle down, clearly. <laughs> it's not. It's nicer this time, though. I think people <laughs> will agree. <laughs> he, he's really just trying uh, to maximize those reward points so that he can play them into some benefit in the future. I wish. Have you ever had a like a San Francisco hotel experience? There's no way to get the same hotel for like a week or more straight. It's that sounds like a problem with your company. All yeah. right. Well, glad you still made it, even though you're hotel hopping. Um, but anyways, just to kick this off, what we've been doing is the overall theme of you know, what we kind of want to think about as we get through this one. It's all about playing the youth. That is today's overarching theme. So keep that in mind if you disagree with something later in the pod. But um, what we are going to touch about, touch on specifically would be Tammy Abraham finding the back of the net, not once, but twice. Lampard's game management this time and the changes he made in the second half. And then there's plenty of other praiseworthy performances like Kovacic, Mountain Zuma, and yes, we will very quickly let Naz give us his personal opinions on VAR and how to fix it in two minutes or less. So uh, <laughs> look forward to that. Uh, but Dan, before we kick it off, uh, we do have a few iTunes reviews to read off. Yeah, they just keep on coming. It is. It's amazing. It's like Tammy Abraham finding the back of the net. You know, once he did it, it just, you know, a flood, right. a flood of goals about to come. Uh, we had Keith Purdue from Ireland. We had Rickster 1611. We had Texas Solar from the Austin Blues. Really appreciate that. And then uh, Esprit also finding us from Bleacher Report. Um Wow. Now, just again, wonderful five star reviews and Apple podcasts. We super appreciate it. Keep them coming. It helps other Chelsea fans find us on iTunes in the Apple podcast store. And we will give you a shout out at the beginning of the next episode, Brandon. Absolutely. A couple shout outs on Instagram. So Nahoon, who can't leave a review on Spotify. So we'll bridge that gap for you. What about anyone else out there struggling to leave reviews first? Let us know. Oh, and Shaney as well. So thank you to you too. But then Patreon, guys. Uh, before we get into who all's <laughs> jumped into Patreon. Right, we have a crazy uh, congratulations. Uh, by this point, no more best of luck. It's done. Pablo on Discord got married. Congratulations, my man. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Big deal, oh, obviously. Uh, so hopefully, you're bringing her into the Chelsea family so we can add another one to the ranks. Um, but all right, quick breath here because we have got quite a few names of the new people who have joined our Patreon. Uh, so a huge thank you to Matthew, Jair, Mike, Rick, Bob, Corey, E. Brisne, Garrett, Kyle, Brent, Adam, Stephen, Mike, Nolan, Dallas, Jamcorn, Travis, Miller, Matt, Sam, Michael, Jack, Chase, Carl, Soggy, Biscotti, Kadil, <laughs> Tyler, Alex, Momchil, Tyler, Brian, Nick, Ronald, John. You all are absolutely amazing. Uh, the Discord server is getting a little bit crowded, but thankfully, Nick, we have plenty of room for all those friendly people. Yeah, well, I'm just really happy that it's going to make Dan have more work to send out more stickers. It was what I was hoping for this entire time. Thank you for basically taking up the rest of Dan's Sunday so that he can uh, just start licking envelopes and putting stamps on those bad boys. Yeah, so. If, if if only I worked for a company that had an expertise in shipping items, that would be just, you know, well, too so fortunate that you don't. So if awesome. only. Yeah. All right, Nick, discount codes. What can the listeners get uh, for being a listener of the pod? Very quickly. I know we've been through a lot of, of previous in this already. Uh, World Soccer Shop, code London Pod, 10% off. We know that you guys have been using it already this um, this summer, and we're looking to continue that. We'll also have a couple of giveaways coming up too. Um, we're just kind of waiting on the final details of those, but September and October, you can expect to see uh, some jersey giveaways from us. Talisman caps uh, at London Blue Ten or London Blue Ten for the promo code. 
and uh, that'll get you 10% off $35 or more. We are working on, on a phase two of our partnership with them right now, which could include new merch to do a contest with. Could also include some specific London is Blue items. So stay tuned for that. We're really excited about that. And then um, finally, Classic Football Shirts is going to have a big sale coming down this week. Uh, you'll see a lot of it on social from us, but uh, we're going to partner with these guys and hopefully sell some really awesome classic football shirts and then do some stuff with them in London. So uh, lots happening. Uh, go support all these guys. We like them. You should too. Naz, you a big fan of the classic football shirt stores that have been on trend lately? Yeah, yeah. There's one in Manchester, one in London, one in Shoreditch near where I live. Uh, yeah, I've been down there. I'd love to have. I'd love to own all of them. You should see how many football shirts I own. I own about forty football shirts. I uh, just found uh, an obscure German football shirt in my closet. Um, I'm back in Manchester at the moment after <laughs> uh, going to London. You know, going to Norwich. Um, and yeah, there's loads of football shirts in here that I haven't. I'm not seen for ages. So I'm like, like a kid in a sweet shop. <laughs> Love that. I am the the same way. My oldest one that I had, which is super random, is a Wigan kit from like ninety-eight, <laughs> ninety maybe two thousands or something like that. I don't even know how I got it, but uh avoided that one, thankfully. So here we go. We're gonna do the match review of Norwich City uh Premier League match at over at Kara Road. Uh scoreline Norwich two, Chelsea three. Uh obviously Tammy with the brace mounts. In between those, uh, Cantwell and Pookie. Obviously, Pookie was going to score. Ridiculous. Um, but now it's kind of the big headline coming coming into this pre-match even as the lineup was announced at Opta Joe. I'm pretty sure you quote tweeted this, said, 21, this is the first time two English players aged 21 or under have scored in a Premier League match for Chelsea since the 22nd of August 1992 when Eddie Newton, familiar name, and Graham Stewart scored for Sheffield Wednesday, throwback, and then also opted Joe talking about how this is the youngest team to line up for Chelsea since, and there's a lot of discrepancies. So you fill in the actual year. <laughs> it's uh, was it 1994? I think it was. Uh, I think yeah, yep. 1994. But it changed because when Pedro left the team, it was it was already the youngest team for a certain amount of years, and it went down to 1994 when Pedro came out. And Got Bar- it. And Barkley's younger than um, Pedro, obviously, so the average age went down and. Yeah, wow. It is. It was a very young team, and um, you know Chelsea's not the team to play youth very much. So this is why this Lampard era. I know he's kind of frustrated about the youth question always getting brought up, but it is uh, kind of a new thing for Chelsea, and uh, it is a kind of um, you know a special period. It's something different that Chelsea fans are not got used to in the Abramovich era. Understandably so. I mean, we all know Nick JT. I mean, that's it. That is our wow. last person to break through from the academy to the first team. It's it's a rare occurrence you could say. How do you, how do you feel if you're Pedro with that stat by the way? <laughs> like how how old do you feel? Like oh cool, I'm I'm only 32 or 33 but you know, let's put a 25-year-old Barkley in there and just watch that number go boop. Yeah, he's he's won everything. I think he's okay. He's probably just he's fine. fine. Yeah, you're right. Um no, it's it's really exciting. I mean, obviously Mount has been a star this year. Tammy stepping up today. There's there's just a lot to like, and I've had friends who support other teams, um, notably some some red teams up up in the Northwest, who are like, you know, hate Chelsea obviously, but love the love the spirit. There's a lot to like about this Chelsea team. I, I think Dan, it's a really interesting time because usually we're the team that everyone loves to hate, but I think there's a lot to like uh, about this squad right now. Well, you think about if Mount gets called up to the England side to the, you know not the U twenty ones, but if gets called up to the first team, if Tammy ends up getting there eventually, you know, at this point you're going to see potentially Chelsea youth players, uh, and, you know, not just Ruben Loftus Cheek, uh, who we probably should not be calling youth player anymore, um, as a part of the first team for England, and that's something that we have not put a lot of great talent in previously or the past couple seasons and as. So I think that's also a part of the impact too, is that people are seeing these young England, you know, prospects who are going to get this opportunity. I think that's kind of helping with that endearing factor to this side. 
Yeah, because, you know, what, what does it mean to be a Chelsea youth player? You kind of didn't believe your chance. You could be as good as somebody like Loftus-Cheek. You didn't get a chance. You didn't get enough of a chance. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he's he's somebody who's been overlooked. And maybe you'd think Mason Mount would be overlooked. hudson Adoy would be overlooked. Maybe uh, Sammy Abraham would be overlooked and never get his chance. Like, a lot of people didn't believe some of these guys would ever play for Chelsea. But a kind of perfect storm of a transfer ban and a Frank Lampard era with the coaching staff who believe in youth as well. You know, Jody Morris was celebrating the pitch in front of the fans. It was beautiful. Uh, Joe Edwards in the coaching staff, Eddie Newton, who you mentioned, you know, Chelsea through and through all these guys. Um, and they want to see local players make it. And this sort of uh, brilliant group of uh, youngsters Chelsea has now, they've had in the past, Jeremy Boga was brilliant. Um, Charlie Masonda was brilliant. Um, you know, Lewis Baker was brilliant as well. But a lot of their talents have been squandered for years. They could have been this group, but... You know, to get a chance at Chelsea means you'll become an even better player. Mason Mount, by wearing this shirt, it makes him grow as a player so confident. I mean, Frank Lampard wants him to believe that he is a Chelsea player. That's what he's trying to... He said that he said that to him this week. He wanted him to feel like a Chelsea player. He asked him that question. Um, and that's the important thing. Um, Abraham, did we, did we think he could do that kind of performance? We never knew, but uh, somebody had to give him a chance so we could kind of find out. And, and you know, what a performance. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's the old trope. If you've listened to Men and Blazers for any amount of time, uh, Roger Bennett, who is uh, an Englishman who's now become an American, um, said, you know, the when he would watch Americans who are, you know, not as talented as like the English teams that would go and play internationally, put on the American shirt, they grew as players. They adopted like as, as much of a steel mentality as they could and they just became the best versions of themselves. And he's like, when I would watch the English players, sometimes that would have the opposite effect. It wouldn't be as, as, you know, as as much of a growth opportunity. And so, what I think what you just mentioned is actually a really interesting point that maybe Tammy Mount Callum, all these guys are feeling like superheroes because they finally like crossed a threshold that they didn't think was available to them. Uh, and and if that's the case, I mean, you know, maybe it's a plus ten percent type of thing, Brandon, where you have the ability to put on a shirt and, and be ten percent better than you ever thought you could be. What's well, kind of interesting, so I think it was Chelsea Youth who retweeted an interview that Jody Morris did last season while at Derby, it's saying a lot of Chelsea managers have absolutely overlooked the Youth Academy, and I didn't realize this at the time. He called out Maurizio Sarri for not going to these UEFA youth matches. He's not going to the U19, the U18. He's literally across the street in his office, and they said that when Ranieri was here, he gave JT a chance because he went and watched him. He goes, you can't know how good these players are if you don't go watch them in person. He's like, there's just something about it. Nothing else can replace it. Um, and so you said, Jody's here. He's going to be the biggest advocate for these guys. Uh, and then another one which I thought was interesting it was uh, actually a quote from Tony Mount, Mason's dad, saying that um, he was telling Mason to leave Chelsea. He goes, there's no chance for young players to break through at this club. Like, look at all the people in front of you. And Mason looked at me and goes, I'm going to be the first one. And now you're like, damn, he's actually going to do it. It looks like like that is that is some swagger. Uh, and that's really obviously exciting for Mason. But not to prevent us from getting into other things, that was fantastic. Dan, we actually haven't even gotten to the lineup yet. So run us through the lineup, the bench, and then we can get into talking about Tammy Abraham. All right. Well, Keppa was between the sticks. We saw the back four of Emerson, Kurt Zuma, Andreas Christensen, and Cesar Aspilicueta. We saw Barkley, Jorginho, and Kovacic ahead of them. And then we saw Mount, Abraham, and Pulisic as our starting lineup. Again, Pedro out due to injury uh, after kind of some warm-ups. And as it looked like it was a kind of a hamstring thing, he was just doing his thing and then ended up pulling up and Frank needed to make the switch. Yeah, it was shooting practice that he got injured in. So we were watching the warm up and uh, Pedro went to take a shot. I think he didn't even shoot. I think he just ran up to the ball and then he stopped in his tracks and it was like, oh, he's done something there. But, you know, you think maybe it's just a tight hamstring, not, a, you know, a full pulling of the hamstring. And uh, yeah, he went into the dressing room. Obviously, the doctors checked him out and he wasn't good enough to go. So you got to make the switch. And Ross Barkley was still, uh, you know, getting ready when he came out. I think he wasn't even quite ready for the walk-on into the onto the Carroll Road pitch. So uh, that was quite funny. And it shows 
that um, you know you have to be ready if you're on the bench. That's that's why these guys warm up, uh, you know, before the match or why they need an elite mentality because to go out there and perform when you're not expected to be playing is uh, quite a difficult thing to do. And uh, you know, Norwich are not an easy team to play against. So impressive from Ross Barkley there. Then we did yeah. see on the bench Marcus Alonso, William, Willie Caballero, Olivier Giroud, Mishi Batshuayi, and Fakayo Tomori. That's right, we had one less player on the bench because Pedro became ineligible for the match due to his injury. Probably opened up the spot for Mishi. Does that sound right, Naz? Well, no, Mitchy was already on the bench, but um, yeah, I think that uh, think that you know they tried to have him on the bench because if you're chasing a game, um, which you might be doing at Carroll Road, then Mitchy's a great finisher, so you might bring him on. Um, but he doesn't seem very fancied so far, does he? Uh, but yeah, they only had six substitutes in the end because I think they could have brought Kennedy along, so that that sort of raises a question: Why wasn't Kennedy there as a sort of extra man, uh, just in case something like that did happen? They could have had him on the bench, but. Uh, yeah, that kind of says maybe his future's in doubt. Um, maybe we could touch upon that later, but I certainly think his future's in, in big doubt now. Yeah, it's uh, not a great sign if you're Kennedy. Obviously, some rumors talk about he's desperate to leave the club as well. Uh, what? All right, fine. Here's the stat that was buried in the script. You're right. This is the youngest side since February of 1994. The confusion was because that was with Pedro. I think it was 2012. So that's the big jump, Nick, you're talking about. You're going from the youngest side in 2012 to the youngest side in 94. Good news, we won this match because we lost 1-2 to two at Oldham Athletic last time. So fountain of youth it is for Chelsea. So uh, Naz, right away. Um, so Chelsea had 23 shots to, to Norwich's 6. 8 on target to Norwich's 5. That just... Norwich were getting way too many shots getting to target because Chelsea had about tw- uh, last time I looked it was it was well over 10 if not 15 or so blocked shots in that match Norwich's center backs closed down everything I think that's a bit of an issue we have right now Chelsea with 54 percent possession and um, eight corners so obviously tons of possession kind of backed them in into their 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 half for a long time. I even tweeted out uh, Norwich defending with 11 for long times. They would clear it and there'd be no one there. Rudiger and Christian would just gather it and recycle it back in. But um, the biggest person to benefit from this was Oi Oi Tammy. Chelsea's new number nine picks up a brace at Carroll Road and does so while scoring two great goals, I'd say, for the for the guys. So Squawka saying he had three shots, two on target, two goals. Very clinical. And then uh, at Grant DeSmith saying, 62 career goals and the first one from outside the box for Tammy Abraham. He has had so many goals scoring in all of these different leagues and youth teams and subs and everything. My biggest question as was, could he do it at this level? Like you said, he just needed a chance. Um, outside of his two goals today, also kind of touch on, how do you think Tammy's looked overall in the small sample we've, we've gotten to see? Well, I think that it was by far his best game, obviously, against Norwich. So um, I was I was very doubtful about him. You know, I, I, I didn't believe that maybe uh, he could be a Chelsea player still. You know, you need to see something. Um, I wanted to see him get the chance, of course. Um, and I think he maybe potentially has a higher ceiling than Michi Batshuayi. He could be a, a better player in the long run. Um, he's got more to his game than Olivier Giroud. Better, a better goal scorer, for sure, than Olivier Giroud. Um, you know, at least, at least at the lower levels. But... We wanted to see him take that next step. And that's why that game was so important against Norwich was that he was taking that next step. I thought, you know, against Man United, he was a little bit bullied. Um, against Liverpool, when he came on, uh, he didn't really impact the game massively. He did okay. Um, he's a decent player. But, you know, I really wanted to see him impact the game, you know, in the final third. And, and, and Lampard spoke about it. Getting that goal builds your confidence. Um, and we saw it. One goal came, became two. He had never scored for Chelsea. He'd, he'd not really scored a lot in the Premier League. But uh, he looks like... He the part massively and I think that he's a really important player because he fits Chelsea's system really well and much better than Giroud because it's a high pressing system you need a lot of energy a lot of pace up front um, I think Lampard wants his striker to go in behind as well which is something Giroud can't do um, so uh, all these things make him kind of a perfect fit you know tactically in the system uh, if he thrives I think Chelsea will do a lot better this season um, I think Giroud will still play and still have an impact um, 
But certainly the striker as a whole at Chelsea with the transfer ban, that was the main position that I was fearing for. You know, you lose Eden Hazard. You didn't work out with Morata. It didn't work out with Higuain. You're thinking, where are the goals coming from? And you're looking at the three strikers and there's a question mark on each of them for various different reasons. Um, and Tammy getting the goals was, is a big deal for that because potentially he's the highest scorer in this team. And and who do you think is going to be Chelsea's top scorer? It's a very difficult question to answer, especially before the Norwich game. And uh, I asked a few journalists, me, Liam and uh, Oli Harbord were talking about it after the Lampard press conference. And we all came up with different answers. I think I said Mason Mount. Um, one of them said Pedro. And uh, yeah, Tammy Abraham, we weren't sure about. And that's, that's down to Abraham. He's got a year to have this chance and now he needs to prove himself. After the year, he either wins, he either sinks or swims. That's what's going to happen this year. Well, I think the interesting thing is Tammy already has matched Olivier Drew's goal contribution in the Premier League for the entirety of last season that he played. Okay, <laughs> okay, easy. Oh, Giroud no, didn't I, get a lot of starts, to be fair. Right. Tammy probably has about as many starts as Giroud did last season, but too. But I, I do think it's something to keep in mind. So you think about William had three goals all of last season in the Premier League, so Pedro had eight. And so he's already like getting to a level when in one game where he's contributing a significant number of goals. And again, it's not good. It's going to be a little bit of, I think, feast and famine, depending upon the opposition, depending upon who he's playing with. But what I saw, and I, you know, I think we've been maybe critical of Nick, is some of the holdup play. I thought his holdup play against those Norwich center backs actually was extremely good, considering that you know, he's been criticized for maybe being a, a little taller, a little lankier than maybe someone like Drew, but I think in general he was able to hold up very, very well and was the reason why our attack was actually more in sync this week than maybe it was in the prior matches. Yeah, so a couple of things. One, the the bar for Tammy is not eight league goals, and and just because that's what <laughs> William has you know achieved so far, it is you know as a, as a top line in his Chelsea career, it doesn't mean anything to me. If if Tammy is going to get the lion's share of the starts, then his his benchmark is twenty league goals. I mean, that's what we need, right? I think everyone kind of recognizes that as like the bar for a Premier League striker of any quality. So I think that's, you know, he's he's 10% there. So, you know, let's let's kind of watch him as he grows. I mean, I think to your point on the holdup play, Dan, that's where I've been the most critical probably of, of Tammy is not, not his hunger to score goals. You know, I mean, he smashed one against the post at Old Trafford and I think got a little bit unlucky there, but... Um, you know, I was more concerned. Could he bring other people into the attack instead of going at it alone? Um, he showed me a lot today. I think he still has a lot of work to do and competing against Giroud, who might be the best in the Premier League at that, um, is, is going to be a growth opportunity for him this year. Um, I was just, I was blown away on the first goal that he had the, the touch and clinicality to finish that. Um, you know, the ball kind of fell to him and as a striker, Naz, you have to be in the right position. You have to have your, you know, kind of your brain switched on at all times to take advantage of that opportunity. And I was so proud of him that he was able to convert that chance. And then obviously his, his hug with Frank Lampard tells you everything you need to know about how, you know, he felt about this opportunity and getting his first goal at Chelsea. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was talking about earlier as well. He, he's kind of backed for, by a manager, you know, through thick and thin. And that's what you need, um, you know, to perform at the highest level as a young guy. And, uh, you know, a lot of players would dream of that opportunity. I spoke to Carlton Cole, who used to play for Chelsea when they had Drogba. And he said he could have dreamt of this opportunity. He wished that he had a run of four games in a row where he could play. And, and whatever he did, he wouldn't get judged. And, and that moment was... Um, you know, the, the Frank Lampard's trust paying off in a player. Uh, the fact he scored such a beautiful goal. I think it was Chelsea's best goal of the season, that goal. It was I a agree. beautiful team move, absolutely sensational. And Tammy was involved in the build-up, um, which, you know, he, he it was on the halfway line. He laid it off to Mason Mount. Mason Mount, a cross-field ball to Christian Pulisic, who drove into the box. Uh, Aspliqueta makes a run on the outside, crosses it in. Mount's also in the box, tries to head the ball. It just misses Mount. Uh, Tammy Abraham comes in, he's run 50 yards, he volleys it first time after running 50 yards, right in the bottom corner. That is a sensational team move. That is exactly what Chelsea wants to accomplish this season. And it's a very, very fast transition, which I thought I thought was a fantastic goal. And, you know, I think it was better than the second goal, even though it was a long-range strike. Um, Naz, that'll be assist Piloqueta to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you, you're everybody. You're cancelled, Nick. 
I am not canceled. I'm even wearing a shirt today. Let's go. <laughs> Your eyes lit up then. Your eyes were lit up. He was, just, he was just waiting to jump in on that. <laughs> uh, you know, look, Tammy, I thought Tammy's um, combination play was fantastic as well. And you, I feel like we see progress in his game, his hold up play and just his ability to, you know, try to ocup- occupy the center backs. He's growing in it. I mean, it's not Diego Costa by any means, but that's OK. Um, so the fact that he was able to, to, you know, show some more improvement and even get on the score sheet is massive. Um, I, I think to your point, though, Naz, like that's a better his first goal is a better finish. Than, than the second goal. Um, it's a harder finish for sure. Yeah. Half volley and, coming through yeah. people. And to keep it low uh, is is really, really hard. You see a lot of people sky that thing into into Rosette, um, and, and that's kind of the, you know, again, your brain just has to be switched on to me. Like, you have to be ready for those opportunities. Frank always was as a Chelsea player coming in late into the box, and so that was that was really impressive, and, and I genuinely was so happy for him uh, you know, I think to get that that weight off your shoulders of not scoring and to do it twice and then to have the support of everybody after he's had a really tough couple of weeks with the, you know, the racism stuff and, you know, not scoring and you know, he didn't start last week. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty great for him. Yeah, and my, what I would say as well is that the exciting thing about Tammy Abraham is he can score different types of goals, um, which we saw in both of those strikes. Um, and, you know, he, he's just a guy who uh, just offers a bit more than Giroud. I think Giroud is a great player, um, but, you know, he's only going to, you need to cross the ball in the box. And I don't think a lot of teams play like that anymore, certainly not at the top level. Um, you know, getting your fullbacks right in behind teams, crossing it in, and Giroud will score a head run over a kick pretty much. Um, but other than that, I don't think he's a, you know, a, a great sort of player in this pressing system. So um, Tammy Abraham, he's the sort of striker Chelsea are looking for and have been looking for. A £58 million striker failed last time. Gonzalo Higuain failed. A guy's playing in the World Cup final. So it's not easy to wear the shirt. Like you said, he's had a hard time. And it's because wearing the Chelsea shirt, it, it can either make you grow um, it can, like Mason Mount and Tammy Abraham seems to be doing, or it can crush you as well. Um, there's two ways of reacting to wearing that blue shirt. Yeah, he, look, he's got the support system. Uh, it looks like he needs to to have a run and be successful. This is just a sign of progress in the right direction. And obviously, he's coming up with the goods. We needed all of his goals to get a result today. And so they weren't even an Higuain's two goals against Brighton. Like these were take the lead, you know, continue to drive forward. You know, the game is tied, break the deadlock. Um, these are very much a uh, pressure situation because everyone been talking, when's Frank going to get his first win? This was huge uh, for the team. And he stepped up and led the line like we, we needed. So um, I also want to point out, I love the tackles he was putting in on some of the center backs. Like he's not afraid to uh, to mix it up with those guys. And I think that's what I love seeing about uh, about him in that number oh, he nine was, role. He was willing so, to body up. He he is willing yeah. to muscle around. And I think he, you know, I, I think the criticism when you're not watching the entirety of the pitch is that he's not putting in the work there. But when you see in some of the replays, or I'm sure Naz, as you were watching there, like he he is putting, he's a combatant. He is someone who's willing to get, you know, rough and tumble a little bit with the center backs and, and force the question of, you know, will you actually be able to match me for 60, 70, 80 minutes? Yeah, definitely. He did. He did a great job of it. You know, it was his all-round play. If he only scored one goal, or didn't he didn't even score, it would have still been a good game. Honestly, he was he was an absolute thorn in the side. Um, there's there so many chances, so many touches in the box that were excellent. Um, it, it was great, especially you know in the first half. He faded a little bit in the second half, but it was kind of a game of patience in the second half. Chelsea had possession; they were managing the game very well. As a striker, you just wait for that chance and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he, he did, he, he got the goal. And that's that's all you need to do as a striker. Um, you don't need to come and find the ball. You need to wait up front and be an option to your team to hit. He either runs short or he goes in behind. Uh, the, the defenders don't know what to do with him because he can do it all. Whereas with Giroud, uh, you can sometimes find that uh, teams know what he's going to do. Um, and, you know, if, if they can stop that threat that Giroud's an expert at doing one thing, if they can stop him doing that, then he's pretty much, uh, you, you know, you can pretty much mark him out of the game. Um, Tammy's going to be more difficult if he can just build up that sort of mentality and that sort of 
uh, you know, that belief in himself, really, that he's, he's capable of playing at this level. The next step will be, obviously, to do it against the top six side. Um, you know, there's going to be further questions in his career. Um, this is by no means the end of the Tammy Abraham story and whether he can make it at Chelsea. But it's just a really, really positive first start. And, you know, whatever, we've just seen a boy realise his dream um, under from the under eights to the Chelsea first team. There's nothing more beautiful than that. It's already a beautiful story. Um, but let's hope that, you know, the story's not over and he keeps writing more and more chapters of it without a doubt yeah my, my final note on this brandon before we move on uh, apparently frank told him today's the day before the match if you believe that kind of stuff um that's jose Mourinho written all over it i know it is exactly <laughs> what i was gonna say like it's if it is if that's true that's pretty impressive love it all right um all right well, we're gonna go ahead and move on to uh seeing who else we thought had a really really good match out there uh we're also going to talk about um you know lampard's tactical changes in the second half to help deal with the pookie party so we're going to take a real quick break again appreciate the support this sponsor gives us financially uh, and we will be right back to continue the conversation all right so jumping right back into it Norwich looked very dangerous in the first half, especially on the back of two goals. Lampard showed some managerial finesse to find some ways to cancel the Pookie party in the second half. So let's talk about how he did this. I'd like to kick this off with a tweet from a contributor, Nisar Kinsella. Uh, it says, big improvement on last week. Much better game in much better game management in the second half. Not conceding in a second half of football is a big bonus. Um, guest of the show, Naz, would you like to comment and elaborate on on this statement? That was a really good tweet by whoever that was, but uh, yeah, <laughs> really good. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's a really important thing because I think that's what Frank Lampard has been looking for. Um, you know, you, you hear it in the press conferences and stuff after the game or before the game. And uh, yeah, you know, this pressing system Chelsea are using is very high intensity. Um, they're going to play three games in a week soon. So they need to know that they can manage a game. Um, the great teams, the difference between a great team uh, and a promising team is one that manages the result, manages the emotions that you feel during a football match, you know, setbacks of a goal against a runner play and stuff like that. So um, the way Chelsea played in the second half was uh, great. They they kept possession much better than they did against any of the other teams they faced this season. Um, they didn't go gung-ho. They didn't panic. There was a patience about them. Uh, they believed in their quality just to break them down eventually. And uh, Frank Lampard was talking as well that at half time. He just said, um, you know, just carry on what you're doing. Um, and, and the reason they did so well was that, you know, the spine of the team were really solid. They were winning the ball back from the Norwich players very quickly. Um, and they were, you know, just recycling the ball, keeping possession. Um, I, I didn't feel like Chelsea were under that much danger. Of course, Ben Godfrey hit the bar from a set piece and there's going to be those kind of things. Chelsea need to improve on set pieces and stuff like that. But really, it would have been a sort of travesty if they uh, lost the game after that second half. They were actually better in the second half than the first half. And um, that's just because, you know, they, they can keep pointing to bad luck, you know, playing well and, and not getting the results. But Really, that's the, that's where you get. That's where games are won when you just control the game. You're looking at Man City. You're looking at the top teams. That's what they all do. Um, and they, they stop the other team going down the other end and causing a threat. And exactly what Chelsea did. And I think that they'll be delighted with that. And and for a young team to do that as well, it means a lot. You know, I, I think. Um, go ahead, Brandon. Oh, well, I was just going to tee you up, honestly. I mean, because it got to the point where I think Norwich changed as well. They must have gotten into halftime and say, "Hey, two-two, like we're we're in a good situation." Yeah. But, I mean, like I said, there's multiple times in the second half, Dan, where Norwich had every single player behind the ball. They were defending in a block 10, essentially. And then we, you know, they would clear it. We'd gain possession and then just go right back at them. Well, what I really like seeing is that the defensive line actually was moving more as a unit in this match. So you saw Christensen, Zuma, Azpilicueta, and Emerson all getting forward in that second half. And, you know, we, we saw in the first half, you know, the Christensen tried to, you know, play the offside, was caught a little off of the, the right area to be, plays one of the, the Norwich players on side, which kind of helps contribute to that goal. In the second half, the solidity of that defensive line pushed forward a little bit more appropriately, managed to stay flat, and actually helped to keep recycling that ball and not giving away the possession, as Naz says. So I think what we had a chance to see was just, a, I don't know if it was a mind transference. You know, we saw last season the 45 to 60 minutes was the you know tight 
uh, tight, tight time when you thought Chelsea weren't always going to give away a goal. And we kind of navigated through Nick that post you know, halftime moment where we've seen a lot of crumbling previously. And, you know, I think Christensen, Zuma, uh, Emerson, Aspilicueta all really stepped up to be a better unit in the second half than they were together in the first half. Yeah, I mean, the team, you know, we, we talked about the space in between, you know, the, the specific units last week as a huge problem, right? You know, we were we were giving Leicester all the time in the in the world to get past our midfield and attack our back four and sometimes our back three, depending on how high up the the field Emerson was at any given time. Um, so that was a huge difference to me. They stayed tighter. Um, you know, the, the units stayed tighter. You saw Tammy dropping deep sometimes to help defend a little bit and then would get back up. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about a second half in which I think Emerson was outstanding again. You know, there, there's a strong argument to be made that it's, it's him and Mason Mount this year uh, as Chelsea's potential players of the year so far. Um, you know, I thought he was he was just outstanding and has, has played a huge role so far. So just, you know, really happy for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's also, you don't have to press like crazy people all the time. And I think Frank is probably employing some different tactics, which is good because we thought that was going to be a huge benefit of his uh, his reign as manager that we can play different styles and still, you know, kind of figure out a way to get it done. And yeah, we, I think it was a much more controlling, conservative, less crazy pressing second half. And that's totally fine. Yeah. I think that's important. I think it's, it, crazy is the right word in a way, because there's almost the Man United game that was four nil. He could have gone in either way, of course, but you know, when, when you go crazy, then you're basically opening up any possible result and you're not controlling the result, uh, you're not controlling the game. And when you play a team like Norwich especially, you're better than them. So to do that, to keep the ball, that just shows your dominance. And, and Chelsea is Chelsea Football Club and that's what they need to do. Um, but yeah, they still conceded two goals um, and, and it was exactly the same problem as Leicester. Um, Buendia, a very good playmaker for Norwich, I thought he was excellent and he assisted both goals and it was just finding that space in between the two lines. It's Everyone's kind of, uh, you know, you look on social media and people are blaming Kurt Zuma. You know, he might have been at fault maybe for the second goal, but they're blaming this guy, that guy, whoever, Jorginho. Um, but really, it's a more tactical issue because, like you said, there's too much space between the lines and it's not individual defensive issues. It's uh, finding that final ball that's uh, killing Chelsea. Teams are being able to do it too often um, and it hurts them. You know, if you just go back to the stats again, and maybe I'll pop up on who scored uh, just to kind of see the trends that they had in this match. I mean, the amount of possession and chances that, that Chelsea had. But again, I just thought that Norwich just stepped to so many of our shots. We just we didn't even get a chance to to test the keeper, sadly. And I felt like that was something that they did so much better than us, as you kind of talk about Zuma Christensen there, Naz. Um, but just kind of the way it the way it developed, I think you're right. Chelsea were very patient. They were very methodical in the second half of continuing to keep possession. But also, I think last season, you would have seen Maritza, it would have been very horizontal, back and forth. You know, we, we got the ball to the 18-yard box, and then we'd stand there. And then we'd hope that, you know, we'd essentially cycle it to the other side. And, and teams would just block in the box because they knew we didn't have an option. Yeah. Like, the ability to get vertical quicker in this match, to me, is just so much of a, just so much of a, a better a better characteristic they they know that yes there's times we should switch the play and possess but there's also times we can hit that killer ball and get in behind and i thought um that was just great to see the the team do it you know even in the second half when norwich is defending with so many players they were still able to create some opportunities and, and get a bunch of shots off i mean i i, I don't know because i didn't watch the stats that close to that season but when when is the last time under Maurizio Sarri, if ever, did we have 23 shots in a match? To me, it just, I don't, that wasn't the way we played last season. No, it's a, it's a lot quicker, definitely. And you're right. Everything you said there is is what Lampard's trying to achieve. And the difference between Sarri and Lampard is that, you know, there's way more freedom as well from the forwards. They can do what they want a little bit more. Whereas Sarri, it was methodical and teams worked it out. They worked out what he was trying to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, 
you know, Pulisic can do something completely random that throws a team off or drags two players out of position, things like that. So um, it's great to see. But I think that, you know, another thing I wanted to do is just praise, you know, for the control of the game, which is sort of the original point was that which which sort of four players would you say control the game? It's the two centre-backs and, you know, two central midfielders who sit deepest, which probably Kovacic and Jorginho. They deserve a lot of credit for the way they played. I thought Kovacic was excellent. He got picked out on TV as having a great game as well. And and Zuma won 100% of his battles. Christensen, very controlled, great in possession as well. Um, and Barkley as well was really good in possession. Um, probably could have done better with his sort of shots. But uh, otherwise, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, you know, a pretty complete performance from the spine of the team. And the great Chelsea teams that Frank Lampard played in, they had a solid spine, absolutely rock solid. Um, and, you know, if you have that central area of the pitch locked down um, for both possession and winning battles, um, then it makes these kind of games so e- so much easier. So, you know, as a professional as you are, that is the perfect transition into the next thing we want to talk about was the other players that deserve some praise today for their performance. It's easy to, you know, say Tammy is the man of the match, and he was, right? And I even tweeted Chelsea's, you know, man of the match poll. Of course it's Tammy, but I loved Kovacic, and it was great to see him getting love on social media because he hasn't always gotten it. Um, His ability to stand out in a midfield three of Jorginho uh, and Barkley was great. Uh, At Statman Dave said, Mateo Kovacic's game by numbers versus Norwich, 81% pass accuracy, 20 for 27 final third passes, 6 of 6 take-ons, 4 for 6 tackles won, 3 fouls won, 1 assist, and I have to go back, he had um, 6 dribbles. Him and Barkley both had six dribbles, which was amazing. Emerson, by the way, and it, with five, another player who I think had a great day out, Nick. Um, so I'll let you continue to wax on about Kovacic, or you can even go down the list, the short list we have of players who had fantastic days out. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think Kovacic is a, a great place to to start. Obviously, you don't have N'Golo Conte in this game, which is a huge loss for any team, but particularly ours, um, because he's just been playing so well the last couple of matches. Uh, Kovacic, Jorginho, Pivot worked in the preseason. Uh, certainly in a midfield three was a little bit different in the way it functioned today. Um, but I really thought his performance was great. He was able to control the ball. He was able to make uh, some pretty dynamic passes. I mean, certainly setting up uh, Tammy for the, for the third goal was great. Um, but I think to me, Dan, his dynamism defensively was where I really, really enjoyed his performance. He made some critical tackles when, when Norwich was trying to to break free. And, you know, I think his ball control in tight quarters to not give the ball up was was special. Yeah, I mean, one benefit of not having Eden Hazard on the pitch this season is that I can actually tell when it's Kovacic playing. And uh, that's that's a big positive there. But he definitely has excelled in a way. And I think we... We will own the fact that maybe we were a little critical of him as a acquisition, as one of the only players Chelsea could sign in this season, uh, this this transfer window. Um, but he he is definitely coming good and definitely showing that he has a lot of a role to play in this high press system, in this high intensity environment, and he's got a motor. And to see him actually go through the match and start to play. 90 minutes, which we didn't see a lot of last season. We saw times where he would play 60, 70 minutes. So we wondered why is any, you know, why is any capable of playing a whole game? Why is he playable of offering the full duration? And that's a really nice transition to see too, because if he can continue this level, continue winning back, uh, maybe even continue assisting play, then he definitely is going to have a significant role to play in this midfield for Chelsea this season because he's offering everything Naz at Lampard wants out of a, a midfielder who's going to win you the ball, who's going to contribute to attack, and who's not going to be able to give you know, who's not going to give up for ninety minutes. Yeah, so the reason why Frank Lampard gets frustrated about the youth question a lot is because he wants to praise guys like Kovacic as well and not not sort of lock it down just to Mount Abraham. I mean, we all get excited about young guys, but they deserve praise too. And yeah, his story is quite interesting because he was a wonder kid of epic proportions as well. Um, And he's not quite lived up to his potential. So uh, this Chelsea move is very important for him, uh, this summer move, because uh, he's hoping, you know, he can become the player that he's always promised to be. He's always promised he's a very good player already, but um, people expected him to be, you know, a superstar like Luka Modric or something like that. 
uh, he's not quite got to that level. So this 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 um, you know being at Chelsea is very important, and uh, you know being trusted. Um, and he's probably the most similar to Kante. When Kante is injured, he's a guy you probably look to to step in and do the job. Uh, sort of ball winner, carrying the ball from att- you know in attacking transition. He's a great dribbler, like you said. You think he's Eden Hazard sometimes because he kind of looks like him from afar uh, when he dribbles um, yeah and Lampard loves that but uh, I think he's he's lacking a bit of identity in his game I think we saw that last season everyone's saying he doesn't score enough goals which he doesn't um, he probably could do with adding a bit more of a final third threat um, so yeah he needs to find out what he's good at he's, he seems to be good at a lot of things but you know what is it, what kind of midfielder does he want to become just a defensive guy or a guy who contributes in attack as well box to box um, it's going to be interesting to see how he develops at Chelsea you know, again, Lampard is going to be a great person to kind of help him find that identity. Uh, you know, touching on Mount quick. So this is from at Chelsea FC on Twitter saying, Frank Lampard has arrived to speak to the media and starts by saying how delighted he is for Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount after their goals. He points out how Mount smoothly adapted to being shifted out to the left before kickoff once Pedro's injury in the warmup happened. Um, so uh, again, he probably is just starting that off now. So you guys just don't ask about it. Just, yep. Check the box. I praise the youth. Now there's other things. Um, and then at F Talent Scout saying Mason Mount had one goal, 38 passes, 84% pass accuracy, five shots, two key passes, two dribbles, one, two tackles, one. Little genius, pure joy to watch. Um, but one I think I'm not that surprised, or I'm sorry, I am more surprised about is the Zuma tweet. Now, as you, you that was your tweet. He won 100% of his duels. Barkley at 90%, Emerson at 88, ASP at 87, yada, yada. Um, he just talked about how like the, the back line looked way more solid. And I think why most people probably assume that when Rudiger's healthy, he'll come in right away for Zuma. So I'd be interested to hear kind of what you think Chelsea's center back pairing will be when Rudiger's healthy. But then also, you know, you can elaborate on Zuma's performance on the day. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to predict, to be honest. I think Chelsea are going to rotate heavily this season. Uh, between those three centre-backs, Rudiger, Zuma and Christensen, um, it's going to be two games a week after the international break. Um, but, you know, the most important thing about Zuma and Christensen is that I think Rudiger could have started this game. Um, I think he's fit enough. I watched him play in midweek in the, uh, you know, the mm-hmm. under-23 game where they, they beat Liverpool comfortably. Rudiger looked absolutely fine. I think he's fit. He said he was fit in an interview as well. Um, but Lampard's still choosing not to use him. Now, if you're a desperate manager, uh, you would just throw him in. You'd just be like, we need our guy. Um, but he's not desperate because Zuma, he believes in him and he believes in Christensen. And Lampard's giving those players that same thing that he's giving Tammy Abraham and the forwards like Mason Mount. Um, I think that Christensen and Zuma as well, they, they need to get to the next level. Exactly what I was saying about Kovacic is true about them. They might not be as young as uh, the strikers, but... Um, they certainly uh, have not established themselves at this very, very high level of football that Chelsea are at. Um, and, you know, it's a big, big chance for them, this uh, this transfer ban as well. So uh, David Luiz has left. Um, these guys have to take it on. Um, now, who's going to start? I don't know. It's, it's all up for grabs. It's absolutely up for grabs. I think that's the way Frank Lampard looks at it, is that all these positions are up for grabs pretty much. Um, a player can lose his spot like that. You know, a few bad games and you're gone. Um, you know, Lampard's a nice guy. He's also ruthless. He's a winner. Um, and uh, I think that, he, you know, Zuma and Christensen needed to play well because they've got Rudiger breathing down the neck and um, that's important. Yeah, I think it's interesting from the fact that, you know, you look at Zuma had like one missed pass initially in the first half and people just wanted to kind of blow up and like, oh, I can't believe he's done it. And then you look at the course of the entire game at one pass issue was very minimal in comparison to the way he defended in the box, the way he was making challenges, that last challenge before the end of the match where he went Air Jordan and, uh, you know, there was the concern around his back for a second. But he he definitely, and Christensen as well, I think are forming a good partnership and a good pairing and starting to understand where the other is going to be. And, you know, I think that's one thing that can't be understated is that Christensen and Zuma to be a really great pairing, need time to play with one another to understand what's going to happen once you know certain situations occur on the pitch. And you can only train that so much. You need 
real game time, Nick, to be able to form that bond and that unity to know where the other player is going to be. And you, you saw more of that today, especially in the second half when they really shorted up and became ball winners, stopping the attack and helped to recycle the ball back to our attackers and midfielders instead of allowing the Pookie party to continue. Yeah, only two points on this would be that, you know, you build confidence through, you know, a performance like that second half where, you know, you have a lot more control. It's a little bit easier on you, to be fair. Um, they weren't attacking us as readily as they were in the first half. And so that's kind of point one. And I think point two is the fact that we haven't had a consistently good half of football from both this pairing um, this season. Um, you know, I think outside of the Super Cup, which was kind of off and on, um, you know, there was there was there seemed to be solidity between Christensen and Zuma, although I think Zuma had the better of the, you know, the better game of the two. So you'd like to see them have a really good game together and see what they can do before Rudiger gets back and I think uh, tries to take one of those spots for his own. Well, I would just like to uh, highlight Emerson as our last player uh, that thought had a really standout day. He's actually uh, was the highest rated on the pitch, according to who scored, which, again, feel free to fight that if you want. But he was an 8.7. Tammy was 8.3. Mount was an 8.2. So those are our top three players statistically, which doesn't take in the eye test. Uh, but Emerson's game by numbers versus Norwich, thanks to Squawka, he had the most touches at 99, the most tackles with seven, the most crosses with six, and the second most chances created with four. The left back also won 88.2% of his duels. So, um, you know, we did see Alonzo yesterday. Uh, and Emerson got pushed up, and Alonzo went to left back. But I think it's definitely going to be Emerson's to lose this season as far as everything. And I love seeing it. I mean, he's he's absolutely finding his, his own form, I think, which is great. I think he's been probably our most consistent player this season so far. Um, I know that the defense has been leaky. I don't think that's all been his fault um, necessarily. So, I, I mean, I, I've just really enjoyed watching him do the things that we thought he could potentially do when he came to Chelsea. And <clears throat> Naz, I mean, this is a guy who is just getting a, a consistent run of games, and he's, a, he's just a talented footballer, period. Yeah, definitely. I believe in him. I totally believe in him. Um, I interviewed him at the end of last season before the Europa League final. I was glad he uh, got into the final team. Um, yeah, I mean, that guy's, you know, physically impressive, quick, technically gifted. Um, I, he was rated highly, you know, before Chelsea signed him. I think Juventus wanted him. He tore his cruciate ligament. He's had to rebuild slowly. You know, when he first joined Chelsea, he was injured um, and it took him a while to get going. But um, he's always been a significant threat to Marcos Alonso, who's had a good couple of good years at Chelsea, got a new contract as well. Um, but it looks like the tide is turning. And I think that Emerson's the guy going forward, like you said. Um, yeah, really good, really good. All right. Well, the uh, last player we'd like to highlight, Naz, is uh, Var. So <laughs> that's Most was disruptive player on the pitch. <laughs> it had a role. What is it good for? Maybe nothing. Maybe something, right? I mean, we're not really sure. It's still early days, but... Um, it sounds like this has been widely reported as um, things that VAR has reviewed um, would be the foul on Tammy that ended up much later leading to Norwich's first goal. By the way, Eric on text hit me with this same thing. A lot happened after Tammy got fouled before Chelsea scored. Okay, Chelsea had many chances to stop that attack. But anyways... Uh, it was still a bad foul, and he should have been cautioned and eventually sent off. So uh, the offsides on the second goal, the challenge on Aspie in the box not being given as a penalty, the stamp on Mason Mount, and then obviously Zuma's disallowed goal. Naz, I'm, I can understand why Z, um, the Zuma goal didn't stand, because if you look at the replay, Giroud ended up making contact with their keeper versus just being straight up. Um, but I can see how it's close. But there's there's a long list here in just one match. And I think there's lists coming from other matches as well. Yeah, but this is what we've got, got to get used to. I think it's probably the first Chelsea game where there's been a lot of VAR incidents. So it's kind of been under the spotlight with the fan base. But um, no, that, that, that Zuma decision was the correct one. You know, the keeper had both hands on the ball. He drops it because Giroud backed into him. Giroud didn't mean to back into him, but it's still a foul um, all day long. It's always been like that. Um, the Mason Mount incident... Um, I think that was a correct decision. It was it was horrible to see Mount get that, but 
Um, it was clearly accidental. Um, no, no intention at all. I don't think Mount would have said that it was intentional. Um, I think that you know most of the decisions were correct. The Aspilicueta one, that was so strange. I couldn't believe that he didn't at least look to VAR. Um, now I don't know if that was a penalty. I think it could have easily been a penalty. Um, but you know he clearly made contact with Aspilicueta. Why wasn't that being questioned or looked at? Um, unbelievable decision, really. I think from the the VAR referee. Um, now that might have been an accident. You might have let it go because. You'd be like, Aspley Quetta was on his blind side. He got kicked. Uh, the player didn't see him. Uh, maybe let him off. But, you know, it's definitely one that should be checked. Um, but, yeah, beyond that, you know, I think I think the it wasn't an awful day for the, the referees. It wasn't an awful day for VAR. We've seen worse in other games. The offside uh, situation, you know, they need to favour the attackers a little bit more. It's too strict on the, uh, you know, in, in favouring defenders. I think that, you know, Raheem Sterling's shoulder being offside um, in the Man City game the other week was um, just absolutely ridiculous. They need to let some of these things go. Um, and, yeah, it's changing the game. We're going to see some unbelievable controversies this season. Chelsea fans are going to be so angry, just like every other fan base, really. Um, and it's going to, you know, Man City had an awful one the other day as well. So uh, against Tottenham, um, a handball right in the last minute. Imagine if that happens at Chelsea in a game that really matters against Tottenham. It's going to be a huge issue. Um, but it's something we have to get used to. The Premier League clubs, they voted for it. I think Chelsea voted to have VAR as well. Um, so we're just going to have to accept it, unfortunately. I don't like it, actually. I wouldn't. I, I wish football didn't have VAR, but um, I understand why they've got it. They want the decisions right. There's a lot of money on the line um, and they want as many as possible right. And apparently they're getting more right than wrong. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a whole new world for us. The bar for VAR should not be... Well, other teams have had it worse. <laughs> like, I mean, like that's the, and I think that's where it's at right now. Like, if, if you're a fan of the NFL, when they, um, you know, instituted instant replay, it took a good five to seven years for them to get like 88% correct calls, uh, which is ludicrous because the people who are running the instant replay in the NFL are the people who make up the rules every single year in, in the, you know, in the players meetings and stuff like that. So I, I mean, I think there has to be a threshold, Dan, of percentage of calls, right. And, and this is over probably three years. So it's probably, it's probably has to get worse before it gets better. But if we are not getting at least 85 to 88 to 90% of these calls, correct knowing that there's going to be a margin of error and knowing that, you know, humans still make mistakes, then I think you got to take a second look at the overall program because it can't be that we get it wrong all the time because humans could just do that without the program and, and keep the game moving. The, the thing that's most concerning is just the consistency piece. And that that's what has to improve dramatically and has to improve quickly because it's going to be a very negative backlash on on the game it's going to be frustrating for a chelsea fans but b all fans of football that you're seeing results that are inconsistent you're seeing some teams get the favor of it some teams not getting the favor of it it's going to create these really awkward storylines and things that are going to take away from you know, we, we're talking about this rather than giving a few more minutes on Mason Mount. We're talking about this rather than giving a few more minutes on Tammy Abraham or Frank Lampard's in, you know, improvement. And we're making that decision to talk about it because it is important. It is important to discuss the fact that this is not where it needs to be. And your, your point, Nick, about the NFL and, and for those of our listeners who, who don't watch the NFL, when it rolled out, an instant replay was a part of the conversation. The way that it disrupted a game, and, and this is a game that already has stopping built in after every single play, was massively disruptive. You would go watch the person run over to a booth, put their eyes you know, into a, a kind of box, look at the play for about 30, 40 seconds, then come back out, and then make the decision. You'd have a commercial break. And, and now, many, many years later, it has become a very good part of the game. It helps, you know, I think it's like 99.99% of plays that they review, they get their call right on. Um, and and that's great. But we, we are not there yet today with VAR. We are not there. I definitely think the Azpilicueta one should have been a penalty. But you know what? At the end of the day, we won through, through all of it. So I'm less concerned. I think you're going to see people be very frustrated and affected like the Man City fans are going to feel aggrieved that they didn't win against Tottenham. I think that's where the conversations are going to spike. Brandon and, and we need to need to, it needs to get better quickly and I don't know how they do that necessarily unless they kind of publish the results or provide higher levels of transparency to like why certain decisions are being made so that 
supporters can at least understand the thought process. But that's not going to happen because they've always protected the referees above everything else. Also, it's super subjective and, and, and that's part of it. So, yeah, um, thanks for reminding us that Chelsea voted for it, Naz, a.k.a. we can't argue with it because we signed up for it. Uh, but it will be part of, you know, a, a learning curve, to say the least, this season. Um, and I thought the biggest point out of this, Dan, is that you said Chelsea got through it. They found a way to still get it done versus using that as a crutch for excuses. And that's, to me, the most important thing. So let's go ahead and wrap with our man of the match poll. Obviously, Dan, we had a clear runaway winner. Um, but that's why we had to have point three in there to uh, talk about all the other great performances from this match. That is correct. Tammy Abraham was 71%, a resounding first place. Kovacic at 15, Mount at 14, and then 1% for other. I imagine that was for VAR. Right. All right. Well, uh, a huge shout out to all of you that voted. A huge shout out to all of you listeners that are still on at this point. And Naz, uh, we're going to wrap part one. So we really are excited to have you back on the podcast. It had been far too long. Looking forward to seeing you uh, in about a month as well. So thank you for hanging out with us. You're always welcome to London, guys. It's your home too. Oh, so kind. Aww. Too kind. Um, obviously go follow him at Nisar Kinsla on Twitter and goal.com is where you can get all of his excellent work. Uh, but that's going to wrap us up for part one listeners. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, let us know what you thought. Again, uh, the rundown, we're talking about Tammy and what's his future have. Uh, we're talking about Lampard's game management. I love Naz's calling out that we got a shutout in the second half. Uh, then we're talking about who else had a praiseworthy performance. And lastly, a little bit on VAR, but we don't really want to keep that one going. So anything else, Chelsea fans, hit us up, social media, email, as always. And until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.